Well, thank you so much for having me, Derek. I really appreciate that y'all were able to come out and learn more about Code for Chicago uh, myself. Um, I'm, my name is Joseph. Uh, in my day job, I'm a product designer at a company called Donut Drive. We have a fundraising application for large nonprofits and social enterprise organizations. Um, but before I actually went into the tech sector, I usually work in the nonprofit space, specifically in mental health and suicide prevention. And so when I was in the space, and maybe some of you kind of have a similar story, but I was trying to transition out of the nonprofit space. I was trying to find opportunities where I can like gain skills, but also not feel like a sellout doing it. Um, and so that's how I was able to find Code for Chicago, where I started off as a designer, and today I'm one of the brigade captains. And today I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we do as an organization, but what I thought was personally more interesting was identifying some of the pain points that we had at having sustainable projects and some solutions we kind of devised to help overcome these struggles. Of course, these are our own stories. I'm sure some of you that have worked on pro bono projects before have your own pain points. So maybe some of the things I'll mention and some things I'll learn from you. So, um, But a little bit more about Code for Chicago. We are, of course, part of the Code for America Brigade Network. For those that don't know, Code for America operates in two lanes. Um, the first lane is the function as a for-profit uh, Cons uh, digital consultancy, um, where they work with local government leaders, and the other lane is they work. They have a brigade network, and it kind of works like kind of a fraternity in that there's local chapters all across the country, and Code for Chicago happens to be one of them. Um, Code for America provides a lot of resources and support for us to make sure we do what we need to do, um, but they give us a lot of autonomy in how we do things. So Code for Chicago, in particular, we are primarily an asynchronous organization. We do everything online. Almost all the projects that we have are all focused on partnerships. So what usually happens is a partner will reach out to us with a problem or a, uh, a project they have in mind. Um, either myself or someone else from the leadership team will sit down and try to scope out the project and identify what are the requirements, what are the deliverables we're trying to accomplish. And once we have a better idea of what that looks like, um, we start identifying volunteers. And in the past, um, we used to do that through Meetup in a series of like onboarding process uh, filtration system to kind of identify volunteers that would be a good fit for specific projects. And so once volunteers were, there, were on their own individual projects, we kind of give a lot of autonomy to the volunteer to kind of de de determine like when they meet, um, how they track their work. Um, the, I think the thing that we do as an organization really well is really support our projects to make sure they're sustainable. Because if you've ever done any pro bono project before, you'll know that volunteering is hard. It's hard in the tech space, it's hard doing it outside of the tech space, and it's hard mostly because it takes a lot of energy and effort after your nine to five in order to make stuff happen. And so um, there was one project in particular that had a huge impact in the way we do things. And this project in particular, the scope of it was essentially we were gathering different data sources from, uh, from different places and showing it on an interactive map. And this project in particular had front-end devs, back-end devs, data analysts, designers, researchers, the whole gamut. And while we were able to churn out a prototype that worked, unfortunately, the project has gone about almost two years in development hell. And we also lost a partnership, too. And so I, uh, as much at the time how painful it was to go through the experience of having to lose a partnership, we did learn a lot from that experience. And today I want to talk specifically about these three specific pain points that we experienced and hoping to share with you how we try to resolve it at the Brigade. So the first thing, um, if anyone has ever done a project, um, either in your real job, if you work in a consultancy or an agency, um, or try to do it in a partnership, um, you'll know when the client comes to you with a solution already in mind for the problem that they're trying to solve. And our job is to like sit down and try to uncover like why is it a problem? Uh, how did you get to the solution that you're thinking of? So we can have a better understanding of what we're trying to do. And even though we might come at a different solution, um, the process to get there might be different. Like for example, on this project in particular, we had, we had conducted about four or five months of exploratory research. This required us to identify participants that were the users for this specific uh, use case. And oh boy, if anyone, is anyone here a UX researcher by any chance or has done research in any capacity as a student? You know that research is hard. And it's hard, not the actual technical part, 
It's finding the participants for your study. It is the most mind-boggling thing. You have to, you have to like, get people money in order to do, participate. And that's not even good enough sometimes because they need to fit, fit like a specific requirement. So if you think it's already hard to do that in a paying job, it's even worse when you're doing it after work. Um, and the process of like emailing folks and setting up time and having them flake out on you, that's a process that you get used to as a researcher. It's, it's become second nature. And so, as you can imagine, when we decided to do exploratory research, this blocked us from doing any design. And so from a project management perspective, we didn't even actually start development maybe like four or five months into this project. And so that delayed the amount of time it took us to start. And so what we could have done instead in retrospect was, um, and let me tell you, when we did do the research and presented it to the client, there's nothing worse than validating your client's assumptions. Uh, and then having them sit down and be like, I knew all this already. But now you have data to prove that it's true. And so um, in retrospect, I think in terms of using good use of our time, if I sat down to talk to the client the problem they were trying to solve and maybe try to get some buy-in on what type of research would be helpful and have value, um, I might have reached out a different methodology. Instead of doing exploratory research, I would have done validation research. And that might have been like user testing or elsewhere. So uh, that was a kind of a big learning experience for me. And when we had partnered with the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, um, or C2SC, as they like to call themselves, um, they are a nonprofit here in Chicagoland, and they provide science and technology education to the wider public. And basically, the scope of this project in particular was basically taking all these designs another volunteer had worked on in Figma and updating their WordPress website. So the scope of that sounds relatively simple for those who are developers, maybe. Um, however, it's so important to sit down and understand, like, why did you come to these designs in the first place? What are you trying to get from these designs? Um, it's not always just like a brand update. There's some things on the website in particular that you need to resolve. For them, they host a lot of events, so event API access to their website was very important. Because what they were doing, if you ever use WordPress or Squarespace, they were copying and pasting the events every single time they wanted to do something. And that was creating a lot of uh, bandwidth for them um, when they wanted to set up a new event kit, uh, recurring event. So it was kind of a Eureka moment when we sat down, and this was over a series of three or four discovery sessions, so sitting down and really understanding their use case. We arrived maybe at the same solution. Yeah, we're still going to update your website, but instead of on WordPress, we're going to move over to Wix, because Wix probably fits these requirements that you stated a lot better. And it's so much better to do that earlier in the process. And if you ever work on a, if you ever develop a website, there's nothing heartbreaking than going halfway into your development cycle and realizing like this technical solution is not feasible. We have to start over. And this saved us so much time. Um, and so in addition to making sure you do your discovery work, you have to make sure your volunteers feel supported. Um, in particular, developers. Any developers here in the room? There's lots of you. Um, the development speed on any volunteer project is not really based on skill. Skill is a big part of it, of course. But it's the amount of effort you're able to actually contribute, right? Um, and at Code for Chicago, most of the folks that come to us are developers. They also happen to be very new in the field. Um, we found at Code for Chicago, I don't know if this is the case for you, Shai Hack, I, I can guess it might be true. A lot of the folks that come to us are either fresh from boot camp uh, or in a degree program ready to graduate and looking to build like technical experience in a cross-collaborative team. And so the thing I didn't realize <laughs> was that junior developers need support. Um, it's not realistic to have a new developer just jump in on a project and they want to understand the code base immediately. That's not realistic. They need a little bit more support. And sometimes that's hard to do on a pro bono project, especially if you yourself are a delivery person and you're actively contributing to the end product. And so one of the things that ended up happening on this project was, if you can imagine, we had a, I don't know if this is the case for Shai Hack Night, but we often will have a kind of a rotating uh, kind of uh, wheel of volunteers coming in and out. And so volunteers would contribute a code here and there. But we didn't have the mechanisms in place to keep ourselves organized. So if you're a developer, if you can imagine working on someone else's code that you can't ask questions about, there's no comments on it, um, just reading this code base that just seems so foreign, it was hard to get people 
in, in the project and able to contribute because there's a high barrier of entry. We didn't think about these things in the future because the projects, the people that you start with are not necessarily the people that will end with the project. And so um, in Code for Chicago, we try to rectify this. We have an internal project where we're trying to reduce the amount of time we onboard volunteers. And so when we started this project, I made it very clear, like, let's not recruit anyone until we get our shit together and identify what is it that we need to do to make sure volunteers feel supported. And for this project in particular, we did a couple things. One, we actually took in consideration the frameworks that people are learning in boot camp. Um, I learned through this process that Ruby was not something that every boot camp was learning. <laughs> It's important, maybe for a job, but for bootcamp people, it was not the case. And so we try to find a technical solution that kind of best fit the volunteers that were coming to us. In addition to that, we set up other mechanisms in place, just having like better documentation. When volunteers join Code for Chicago, they have a series of lists in their Kanban board that they have to accomplish. One of these things is sitting down, and even if the sprint is just setting up your dev environment, that's okay. If it takes you two weeks to set up your dev environment, that's, more, that's the most important, because. Not everyone can set up their dev environment in one hour. It, for some people, it can be challenging. You run into bugs, you run into issues, right? In addition, the biggest game changer for us was being more specific about the work we were trying to distribute. To illustrate an example, say I want to give you this home page of our website that we want you to develop. In the past, we would have just given someone this whole entire page to develop within a specific deadline, maybe two weeks. Uh, now. We just have you do this hero banner. We just work at small bits at a little time. Because we found that when we assign tickets to people and we gave them a large amount of work that maybe would be shorter on a nine to five, it will take longer on a volunteer project. And it would often block other developers from contributing to the code base. So when, when, at, when you use this strategy, and it doesn't work for everything, obviously, but for this specific project, it works really well. Someone can work on the hero banner, someone can work on the section that's right below it, and there's no real conflict that's happening in between all of that. And so having these things and making sure we have a lead developer on board where their role is mainly just to review code, write tickets, and support developers was game changing for us. To just shift the mentality from just doing delivery to making sure volunteers feel supported. Um, and the last but not least, to make sure your partnership survives, you both have to be on the same page. Um, there's a big thing in the design and research space where we, when you work with like uh, partners in the community, then you make sure the partners are driving the delivery of the project. What I didn't realize in real life, what this means is the partners have to have banner to actually contribute to the project. What this means is um, when they're driving the project, they have to make time to meet with you. They have to make time to email you. And these sound very easy things to do, but when you work in the nonprofit space, you work many hats. And I found that these people are very busy. And while they're very grateful for the support and value we provide to them, sometimes we're not the highest priority. And so for this project in particular, um, I didn't check in regularly. It was kind of ad hoc on their own time. Um, we didn't, it didn't occur to me I should write notes during our meetings. That's crazy, right? I do this in my job all the time, but it didn't occur to me outside of my nine to five, I should just document what we talked about. Because I can't tell you how many times we were backtracking, like, what did we talk about last time? Um, it's crazy. And the last, but finally the least, is when you're doing a project for free, do not promise deadlines. <laughs> Do not. I know it, there's a temptation, and nonprofit partners will have an executive board they have to adhere to, and they're like, oh, what? They're very eager, and all that's valid, but it's just not feasible. I can't tell, I can't sit in the call and be like, why aren't you people in your spare time contributing? I said two weeks ago, where, where was I? Sorry, that was a little spit. I don't know if the camera got that. Um, <laughs> Two weeks, ago, it's, not, it's not realistic. I can't demand volunteers to like, contribute to a project. That's unrealistic. And so in our new partnership with the Chicago Defender Charities, which is a no, another local uh, Chicago not-for-profit, um, they are famous for hosting the Bud Billiken Parade that happens here in Bronzeville. Um, the scope of this project in particular was um, basically building a website and brand identity from the ground up. And so when we started this project, I made sure we set the right expectations. And yes, it was documentation all the way for this one. Um, it's really like going to the extent of documenting what are we going to contribute as both separate organizations? What are our roles in this project? It's also like defining the scope early on and being very clear. These are the things that we're going to meet. Um, and 
obviously this is a living document, but I want to make sure this is in place because I don't want to like start scope creeping because that's very easy thing to do in these types of projects. Making sure we meet the delivery that we, deliverable that we said we were going to do. And just like putting time on the calendar, saying like, when are you available? Every other Friday? Dope, let's do that. Every other Friday that's meet, there will be some update. You, you'll be surprised how many updates you might have on my end and their end. And just having time in the calendar, not going through email tag and trying to figure out like, when are you available and having not to wait a week. So just making sure we are on the same page and in sync the entire time. And, and most importantly, I didn't promise any deadlines. I make that very clear in the partnership. And it's very, temp there's, a, it's, there's a temptation, right? Because you want to make sure the partner's happy and you want to make sure they're taken care of. But it's not fair to them for me to promise deadlines because I cannot, I just cannot promise that. And so we had to start taking kind of a hard stance on that. And so if the partner was not okay with us having the deadline, we'd have to be okay with letting that partnership go. Because in the end, it would not be fair to either organization if I said I was gonna do something and I couldn't follow through with it. So, so for those that are just popping in to the last minute or the last couple of minutes were just a blur, here's a summation of basically what I talked about. Um, just spend time setting up the project. When you, when you get a partner or you decide to do a project, like don't feel tempted, and this is the temptation I had because at Kofi Chicago, I just want to keep growing projects. It was like addicting, it's like a drug. It was just like, oh, it's so awesome, all these people working on different things, but like I found myself like just recruiting people for projects that were not properly set up yet. And I didn't define the scope. We hadn't do any like reasonable technical research. And so, and I found that volunteer, some volunteers don't want to do like the discovery work. They just want to do the deliverable and that's okay. Some, some volunteers will want to sit down, talk to the volunteer, have an understanding how you set things up. And some would just want to contribute to the code base and that's all right. Uh, but yeah, take whatever time you need to set up. Don't feel tempted to get started right away unless you feel ready. Um, just document anything. Like, like I said earlier, the, the people that start the project will not necessarily be people at the end. And if you ever had a job where someone had all the knowledge in their mind and they left that job, <laughs> that happened so many times at Kofi Chicago, it's disheartening. Because like, you know, when they decide to leave, they leave. And you know, most of the time, that'll be it. And I'm lucky if I hear back from them since, because people want to be able to kind of have appropriate boundaries, and that's totally okay. So just make sure you document things along the way. That way you're never backtracking and figuring out, like, wh why do we do that? Why do we come to that decision? And if, if it wasn't clear, like, project management is so crucial. Um, even if you might not call yourself a project manager, if you're creating tickets, if you're organizing people, that's some type of project management. And so if you're leading a project, like, yes, if you want to do the delivery, the verbals, that's fine, but you have to set time aside to make sure some of these mechanisms are in place to make sure your group feels organized. Because volunteers want to come in, they want to feel like they have value. You don't, I don't know how many times I've sat in a group and just like, what are we doing? Like, what are we contributing to? I just feel like you're wasting your time. And just know it just take time. The pro some projects you think in your head, like in my job, this would take a month. Sometimes these civic tech initiatives can take a while. And that's really contingent on the amount of effort that people can contribute to a project and you know, other unforeseen obstacles that come along the way. So if you're interested in joining Code for Chicago, just wanna make it very clear, we do things outside of doing things that are related to code. For example, um, we did a partnership with Legal A Chicago, well, which was very design heavy, and we designed a lot of their COVID-19 flyers. Um, oops. Uh, we did a partnership with the Parks of Oak Park Chicago, um, where we did a competitive analysis uh, identifying different data collection uh, solutions, um, and this was very research focused. And so, um, in the past, we used to do a lot of our recruitment through Meetup, um, but right now we're in the process of updating our onboarding processing because I found I was calculating how many hours I was spending recruiting volunteers, and it came up to like 14 hours a month, which is a lot after your nine to five, I found. So we're taking time to find out better process to make sure it's sustainable, not for the brigade, but mostly for myself. Um, and so if you're interested on in when we do recruit, which we are not recruiting right now, but you're free, free to go to our website, coforchicago.org, uh, go to the Slack icon on, in, in the nav bar, and just follow along. Um, we're hoping to start recruitment by maybe the end of the month, maybe next month. So uh, yeah, hoping, hoping to see some of you there in the near future. That's it. Thank you. I'm just curious, and this is a kind of detailed question, what were the frameworks that were popular coming out of boot camps? If not, not Ruby. Oh man, you're asking a product designer. Oh, um, sorry, okay. <laughs> I can, yeah, I can go look in your notes. 
Um, React is, I know for a fact React was something that everyone asked me, that's something that did. So that was the one I know off the top of my head. So uh, what's the delta between if you're working in a full-time job and people are getting paid uh, versus working in a project that's led by, that's, that's uh, developed by volunteers? Is that, is that, is that like, you know, 95% uh, reduction in efficiency or is it 90% or is it 99%? That, that's a, I love the way your mind thinks. Um, that's great. Um, so, uh, I don't know if this answers your question, but I've, I've come, I think some brigades will expect maybe like six or eight hours of people's time a week. I personally don't think that's realistic. I tell volunteers, if you can contribute anywhere for half an hour to two hours a week, that's fine. And I think that actually maps to what some most people's experiences might be. So I don't know how that comes up in percentages, whatever, whatever two divided by 40 might be. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the, the output for something like that is very small. So we, we take a little bit more time than, we, than, we, than you would in your day to job. So. I have a question. One, um, so I'm familiar with Code for America and the sort of broader brigade network. Kind of curious, is some of these learnings uh, shared with other brigades? Uh, have you given this talk to them? Have you heard similar feedback from other brigades who are doing similar work in other cities? That's a great question. It, it happens sometimes when I'm mingling with other brigades that these questions will come up um, or we'll maybe talk in discussion. I haven't done this specific presentation to a brigade group before. Um, you were my guinea pigs. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, well, we haven't shared this out yet. So um, I know you mentioned a few during your presentation, but um, can you talk a bit about any like projects that are ongoing currently and um, or some in the past that have been um, like cool to work on. Um, and also yeah. another question, I'm, I'm curious, how big is the organization? That's a good question. Um, right now, last time I did a, a head count, it might have been around 30 to 40 volunteers across maybe like six or seven projects off the top of my head, a couple of them that are ending next month. Um, the types of projects that we get might not map to what some people would get at a, would want at a boot camp. There are a lot of web development projects. So some of the examples illustrated kind of encapsulate a lot of the types of projects we get. Um, you know, a lot of orga nonprofit organizations won't, like, aren't regularly storing data, so oftentimes we won't get projects that are related to, like contain data in some sort of way. So they end up being like website re redesigns, like visual design projects. Um, but yeah, that, you know, those, that's kind of like the crux of the projects we're getting right now. Hi, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm wondering, if, is there a discrepancy between the types of tools and technologies that volunteers want to use and the types of things that organizations can maintain? That's a great question. Um, yeah, that, that's something we think about um, when, we're, when we're scoping things. Um, the, uh, the thing we think about is like we're not going to be able to sustain this project after its, its end. We're not going to be, be able to provide. So if we do a project that has a code base, we have to make sure they're able to like pay someone to actually do that or do that on their own because there's no, we don't promise that we can support that project soon after it's done. So um, we often will recommend a Squarespace or like some sort of CMS solution if it's like a website redesign, mostly because those are like very easy to use um, and they usually will fit their use case and meet their needs usually. So. Um, but yeah, we do take in consideration um, kind, of the, kind of the technical overhead that's required. I think the one project that um, we were just talking about, um, that I used as an example for this presentation, um, one of the explicit discussions we had was like, if we build this code base, because we had built the backend on Firebase, for example, um, one of the things they wanted to do was kind of document what is exactly the skills that, that someone would need to, in order to maintain that later on. Um, and so um, we, on, a, on chance occasion, they might be in a, position to do that, um, fund someone to actually maintain the project, so. Uh, this is a question from the live stream. Uh, how do nonprofit or civic organizations reach out to Code for Chicago for help? That's a great question. Um, so we don't actively promote ourselves. Um, we kind of, I kind of, the truth is I like on the website, there's like a form on the bottom that people submit and I respond to that. <laughs> um, I'm deliberately not advertising it because I just cannot sustain the organization with the amount of like requests that might come in. Um, it's, it's just like it, the temptation to take every single project that comes our way, um, it's there and I very much want to do it. But what ends up happening is I'm not able to identify a project manager. I end up having to do it and I end up having to do like three or four projects. So it's, it's, just, it's just not feasible. So uh, most of the time they'll, they'll reach out to us. Um, we've done enough projects up to this point where we'll get word of mouth. 
Um, but other than that, we don't actively promote, at least right now, until we find a sustainable way uh, to keep our brigade going. Well, not from live stream. This is, this is from me personally. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Derek. <laughs> um, I was going to ask too, on, on that point of project management, it seemed like on your slides there's a lot of uh, Google Docs. I'm curious, are there any other kind of tools that you found really helpful for kind of more the project management side of things? That's a great question. We have no money. So there's no way I'm funding Jira or Confluence from our budget. <laughs> um, so, like, it, honestly, a lot of the tools that we end up Picking, like, they are free tools that we're using. Like, I have a Trello account, and if anyone has Trello, if you want to pay for it, you have to pay for it per user. And so the hack way that I've done it is I just create different, like, workspaces. And you can have, like, maybe nine. So I have maybe three workspaces of project spanning, <laughs> abusing the free account. So, yeah, we don't... Honestly, the project manager tools we use to the full extent is probably Google Doc um, and Trello. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I mean, Jira and Confluence, those would be nice, but those are things that we can't fund or pay for. I think I saw you use Miro, too, Miro boards. Oh, yes, yeah. we use the free <laughs> account for Miro as well. So three, I, for those that know, three boards. So I have several workspaces for that board. I actually asked a nonprofit partner to create the account so we can have access to that board. So. Um, so I know you had a slide up there in terms of like a lot of the developers who are working with the organization. What would you say is the split between, let's say, developers, designers, project managers? Obviously, I think it's going to be a little bit developer heavy. But from the other two buckets, um, what, what level of support are you guys getting from those volunteers? Yeah, that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, I, this is an answer question immediately, just but so everyone has a frame of reference. I pretty much will accept any volunteer that comes our way and put them on a project. Projects can be an excessive amount of people on one. I, on the one I was using, for example, there might have been 20 people on that project. And in terms of the breakdown for that, it's pretty much representative of most projects, depending on the scope. Um, so if we do have a project that has a code base or something that has to be maintained by developers, oftentimes it will maybe come out to be maybe more like 60-ish percent developers, and then like the rundown would be like maybe the rest of it might be designers and researchers. Um, and then, yeah, the, I think off the top of my head, but it really depends on the scope. Obviously, for the visual designs, I'm not going to have any developers for, the, for those type of projects. Do you ever partner with corporations who want to give their developers time for, let's say, a half a day or a day, and you take on a project and use those volunteer hours? Yeah, we've been approached a couple of times by those types of organizations. The problem is that we don't have, um, I think, to be able to host, like, I think that would be a, its own hack night, I guess. Um, we just don't have like, the capacity, or like, I can't identify someone who's willing to host that, because usually it'll be on their nine to five time. So that would require one of us to like, take time off from our actual jobs to host that. So you know, it, it's just hard logistically in order to figure that out. I'd be happy to do it if we can find a way to shoehorn um, a, a way we can get a bunch of people to just work on specific deliverables for like a day. Um, but I, I haven't set time aside to like, figure out what that looks like yet. So. I swear, it's just not me talking. <laughs> it's a live stream question. <laughs> um, beyond working on projects, is Code for Chicago connecting with other nonprofits or organizations in any other ways? That's a great question. Um, I guess aside from building projects, like building partnerships, um, no, we haven't. And I think that's just more of like a capacity problem. Um, last year, we spent a lot of time just building projects. I think when I, before I became Brigade Captain, maybe we had one or two active projects. So one of the initiatives we had at the time was just building as much projects as possible. Um, and so I think there's a desire, and people have talked to me about wanting to do things with other nonprofits that isn't necessarily project-oriented, but just the capacity to do that and identifying people to do that isn't there yet. Um, but we do have like one, for example, um, that we're doing with um, ITT, the Illinois Tech Technical Institute. Oh, I just butchered the name. Um, but yeah, they, they have like a, we'll have opportunities like that where the a professor will come to us asking us like, hey, do you have any developers that can help, like, help us with this class? Um, like this class in particular is like a prototyping class, so they need a developer to validate the students' ideas. And stuff like that will come up and you know, usually I reach out to volunteers and see if they're interested. The thing is that most volunteers that come to us want to do projects. I haven't, there's very, like, off the top of my head, a small percentage of volunteers who want to do non-project stuff. So. Um, so obviously you've mentioned talking with or doing projects with nonprofits around the city. Um, have you guys had any luck get, being able to engage like actual official entities like the, the city of Chicago in any way? Oh, I've tried. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's right. I get, like the last time we had a call with them, I think they wanted like spe- like a specific amount of hours to contribute a week, and that was one of the things. Of just making it very clear, we can't expect volunteers to contribute. I think they were hoping we can give them one volunteer um, to commit to ten hours of volunteer time a week. I was like, there's no way I'm com- I'm going to commit to that. That's just not realistic. So it, that thing fell apart. I think uh, that's a really great question because the whole point of the brigade system, just the network as a whole, it's a, Ideally, to connect with like local civic organizations, um, specifically local government. The problem with the city of Chicago is that they can fund most of the positions. And so, when we've been reached out, one of the things I asked, and one of the requirements I have for partnership is that you can't, you can't be getting volunteer time in lieu of paying for someone for the sexual thing. Um, so that's a roadblock that I run into because I just make it explicitly clear, like I can't put someone on a project where you can actually like physically pay for it. So like a lot of the nonprofits we'll work with usually are very small and there's no way they would be able to contract someone to work on this type of project or if they would, it would be a big dent on their budget. Two parts. One is who do you say no to and what do you think about like the difference between volunteer versus paid projects and like how that kind of changes the relationship with your potential partners? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first one, I say no to like some of the things I mentioned here in the presentation, if there's mandated deadlines. Um, if the expectations are unrealistic, like I said, 10 hours a week for volunteer time, I don't, I don't think that's, especially for like the types of volunteers we get that are junior level, there's no way they're gonna be able to provide value in those 10 hours, even if they did want to. Um, and then um, usually it has, it has to meet a specific criteria. It has to be a not-for-profit. So we have been reached by like for-profit, like social impact organizations. Um, but I make it very clear, it's like, you know, unfortunately we have a hard line with this. I, you know, I respect the product that you want to put out, um, but you know, you have to have like a 413B or like at least be a mutual aid group in order for us to like work with you. So those are our hard no's. Usually if the mandate deadlines and if the organization doesn't meet the like a preset requirements. And then, uh, can you repeat your second question, Derek? Yeah, just thinking about the uh, trade-offs between you know doing volunteer work and doing paid work, and sort of how that affects the client or the the, vol- the, the partnership. Yeah, I th- I think the benefit because I, I did work in, con- in consult in a consultancy. Um, the benefit of doing a pro bono project is that you don't have like to, there's still, there's no sense of rush because we have a lot of leverage essentially because we are providing value to you that you can't you otherwise are not paying for. Um, so that means like when we scope a project, we can actually include research. I don't know if some of you maybe who work in consultancy, maybe you can tell me otherwise, but at mine, it was so hard to get clients to cough up money to want to do research. Research is so important. Usually they're thinking of doing a developer in mind uh, for most of the solutions, but doing research is just so important. And so that gives us like leverage to do whatever methodology we think meets the best solution for this um, problem we're trying to solve. So we're not restricted by, because we're not restricted by pay, that also we're not restricted by deadlines, that also does, doesn't mean we're restricted by how much we have to commit to at any, any, any certain given time. So I feel like we have a lot of freedom. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Do most of your projects reach fruition or do you get a lot of drop off in the middle for, for folks? You mean like if I'm looking for a specific number of size group for each project? Um, Not necessarily. So obviously you're going to engage with a number of nonprofits for different projects. And like you said, you have kind of a rotating door of folks who come in and help. Do you have a lot of projects who you just kind of go to them and say, look, we tried, but like we didn't make it all the way to the end and we don't really have the same, you know, group of volunteers to finish what we started. Is there, are there a lot of like projects that kind of get kind of die off? Aside from the one project I just talked about just now, um, yeah, there have been other initiatives that haven't gone in very far. Um, um, are you talking? Are you thinking about maybe how long that would take in order for a project, or just you're just curious to know like if that's had happened to us aside of this project? Um, I'm, I'm really thinking. You know, I, I appreciate what you're saying in terms of like not not having deadlines and you know kind of running things because you are volunteering. But I'm wondering as people kind of rotate in and out of the brigade, do you kind of lose some of the skill sets and you have to go back to to clients and say, hey, you know, we just, we, we can't kind of finish this out. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. That hasn't happened yet. Usually what happens is um, the projects that I'm thinking off the top of my head that, ha- that, that started but didn't get anywhere, we're kind of still like either in the discovery phase um, 
or haven't been really fully sculpted out yet. So we haven't had the issue yet where we come to them. Usually a lot of the skills, the projects we will take on are things that we can realistically do. Sometimes I'll get um, non nonprofit partners that will want us to do something with their SEO or want something to do with con like content strategy. And that's a skill set that we typically don't have. Um, so I, I will not promise that as part of delivery for the project. So I try to identify a project at the onset that will more than likely meet the skill set of the volunteers. And that's usually web development. Well, I think that wraps it up. So thank you, Joseph. This was really, really awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.